Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. A very warm welcome to all of you in this course titled Development Processes and Social Movements and uh, this is your 18th lecture of this course which I have titled as Environmental Movements in India. So, so far you have already read about numerous other movements for instance women's movements, caste movements and other uh, things about democratic processes for instance caste as well as the regional imbalances, federalism, etc. So, about this course, the interesting thing is uh, that the way we have designed it, we have linked the two things, development processes and social movements. So, if you will look at environmental movements, then it is one of the most, uh, you can say, ever growing kind of uh, area where you come across numerous kinds of movements starting from Chipko to the recent instances of say Niamgiri and Plachimada. So, I will give you a broad overview of uh, numerous movements which have taken place in India. So, first of all, let me begin with uh, environment as a concept. So, before we start environmental movement, let us first learn what is environment and why do we need to know about environment. So, what is environment and it is one of the most can say common topic which is talked and since the class 3 or 4 we have a paper called environmental sciences which is called EVS. So, what is environment? It is a sum total of material and non-material or you can even say living and non-living things. So, it encompasses almost everything which is around us. So, from say uh, the land that we see or to the trees or the ponds, everything that has a living and non-living component is environment. So, why do we need to study about environment? So, it was only in say 1950s, 60s onwards that it was considered that it is important to study environment and its different facets. That is why environmental education emerged as an interdisciplinary area and you come across numerous ideas like say environmental history, environmental politics to environmental economics, environmental ethics. So, different disciplines approach the issue of environment as per their concern. So, the students of history will study environmental history, the student of political science, they do environmental politics. So, whatever the orientation of the subject is, in that way environment can be approached. For example, I will give you the example of environmental politics because uh, politics is my major discipline. So, in environmental politics, we learn about the dimension of uh, power. So, in politics it is the power which is the most important thing. Similarly, if you go for history, then in history for instance whatever the history of a country is, in the same way we can also approach its environmental history. For example, if you look at Chipko, then the study done by Ramchandra Guha will tell you that its history goes back to say 1920s or even much before that. So, let us move on to this issue of what is the range of environmental issues. So, for instance, here I have mentioned just 6-7 of them, but you may go up to numerous instances which are around environment. So, be it deforestation or air pollution, similarly river water pollution or depleting groundwater. These are the issues which you often get to know say in the newspaper or in the numerous reports which are published by the government. Similarly, land degradation, the quality of soil is degrading. Similarly, sand mining, their sand mining is another major issue in which a lot of criminalization kind of thing is also there. Then be it loss of habitats or extinction of wild animals, you must have heard of uh, things like say project tiger or uh, even uh, the dolphin conservation. So, what has happened is that since numerous uh, wild animals or even uh, these uh, flora fauna are endangered, so we need to uh, save them. So, numerous kinds of drives do take place things like project tiger etc in order to save them. Uh, climate change is something all of you must have heard about, climate change and global warming. These are the two 
you can say uh, most popular kind of terms around environment we often hear about climate change and recently also COP27 took place uh, around so COP is conference of parties so all over the world all, all numerous countries which come together in order to have a summit kind of thing uh, that what are the things that we need to conserve the nature. So last point that I have mentioned is about question of allocation, distribution and the use of natural resources. So why this topic and this is this uh, is related to what I mentioned about power. So who decides that who will get what, who will distribute, for instance there is a forest or there is a river. So who will decide that who will use how much water or who will have control upon the forest. So these three issues allocation, distribution and use and the natural resources can be numerous be it what I mentioned to you forests or say rivers because later on all the movements that we will study there I will tell you how these contestations often uh, lead to social movements. So that is why you need to keep these points in your mind when, when we move on to the next slides. These are the things that you should have at the back of your mind. That This is the range of issues which are around environment and we need a, a discipline like environmental education in order to study this. But here our concern is to learn about environmental movements. So we will gradually move on to the movement uh, dimension. So let me first tell you about the environmental issues there we have named the issues and here I am going to talk about the larger concerns or what are the ongoing debates on environment. So let me tell you there are three major issues which are there and here I am talking about the global worldwide what are the concerns which are going on around environmental issues. So first issue is the regional divide. So how to explain the regional divide? So there is first world, there is third world which we also call say developed countries and developing countries or we also have its name as west east or north south divide. So the whole world if you will look at the globe you will see that most of the developed countries are in the northern part of the globe while all most of the developing countries are in the southern part. So this regional divide is something which is also uh, one of the major environmental concern. For example, the first world countries, the developed countries, they often blame the developing countries that they are responsible for the environmental degradation because here the population is more and uh, people even use uh, say things like uh, they still use wood, they burn the woods so there is flame of that. So these are the things for which they blame the developing countries for being the major cause behind the environmental degradation. And similarly, it is the third world countries which say who say that it is the first world which is uh, more problematic because their, their level of energy consumption is much higher. Similarly, uh, energy consumption in two, three ways, their use of electricity to uh, the way they have uh, their industrialization took place much before us or even today uh, the number of cars used by them. So their lifestyle is in such a way that they tend to consume much more. So that north-south divide is something which is about the regional divide, how the whole world is divided into two parts and it's like a blame game kind of thing that the developed countries blame the developing countries and developing countries blame the developed countries. So this is one uh, issue about the regional divide. Then we come to the ideological divide. In ideological divide, here I have mentioned the four or five points. For instance, first is the Gandhian way of looking at environment. Then there is feminist way. And within feminism also there are two ways. One is the eco-feminism and another is feminist environmentalism. So similarly, there are others like Marxist, socialist, radicals, etc. So to have mentioned these ideological divides, let me first tell you that in political science we study mainly two ideological divides, one the liberalism and the Marxism. So here in while studying ecology or you can say uh, while studying about environment, we talk more about say um, uh, the Gandhian way of uh, looking at. So what will be Gandhi uh, always stressed on using less and less of things. So 
the decentralized kind of approach to have uh, to use the environment that your uh, minimum consumption is the key. So, you can save the planet only if everyone is equally concerned about using it to the least. So, there should be no misuse of nature and natural resources. Then coming to the feminism, uh, the feminist way of looking at environment is that it is the uh, women who are prone to be closer to nature. So, they have this tendency to conserve the nature. And if you look at these two, uh, eco-feminism and uh, feminist environmentalism. So, mainly I will tell you uh, two thinkers, it is the Vandana Shiva who talks about eco-feminism and Bina Agrawal talks about feminist environmentalism. So, why these two trends within feminism? So, eco-feminism is something which says that the nature culture interlinking kind of thing and uh, they tend to say that it is the in the primitive ages or you can say in the old uh, in the ancient days it is the women who were uh, the, the conserve who used to conserve the nature much more. But if you look at feminist environmentalism, they will say that it is the issue of access that who of how much control do the women have. And feminist uh, environmentalism stresses on you can say uh, the class issue of environment that it is the women who do not have much of control on the nature which should actually be increased gradually. Then the Marxists will say that uh, it is the capitalism which is one of the biggest problems and it is the capitalism which is uh, leading to environmental degradation and Marxists and socialists have more or less similar position and radical environmentalism that is one of the most recent kind of add-on and they talk about an alternative lifestyle and in that way you can also say that they are closer to Gandhian in that sense where conservation is the key that uh, the, the lifestyle should be such that uh, we should go for the minimalist kind of use of nature. So, you can say uh, it is minimalism which has become the keyword. So, the people who follow minimalism they are called the minimalists that is th those who use less of things. So, nowadays the formula which is often said is that less is more. So, those who have lesser things, they will, they are adding on to lesser carbon footprints. So, they have less to worry, they will not feel guilty about causing problem to the mother earth. Then the third issue is the class divide. What is class divide? Class divide is basically uh, the issue of Marxism because in Marxism class as a category is most central. Uh, so, why we talk about class divide? Because one thing is about the elite and the bourgeois environmentalism about which uh, Amita Bhaviskar talks. She says that who is concerned about environmentalism and she says those who are the poor, they do not know how to talk about environment or, or say their concern is not something they are able to express. So, it is the rich people who are actually uh, expressing their voice. So, it is the elite or the bourgeois who are claiming that we need to conserve the nature or we need to protect the environment. Then the second school is which I have called the livelihood environmentalism and Jairam Ramesh who was uh, the former uh, minister, one of the cabinet ministers, he has talked about livelihood environmentalism that there are those people whose uh, lives are completely dependent on environment itself. For example, uh, the fishermen community who go for fishing. So, for them if there will be no river then how will they do fishing? Similarly, uh, those who are dependent on uh, forests for their uh, the dry leaves if they are using uh, that as their or even those who need the fodder etc. So, it is about the livelihood for which environment needs to be conserved. So, livelihood environmentalism in that sense is different from that of elite environmentalism. Then the third I have mentioned is environmentalism of the poor. This is a concept which Martinez Allier has used and he says that in India we get to see that it is the poor people for whom environment is one of the major concerns and there he differentiates it with that of those who are concerned about environment in the west. In the west here I mean in the developed countries because in the developed countries uh, conserving the nature is about say 
uh, spending time with the nature or to have to have a clean lake or to have greenery around is something uh, we look at nature as a luxury being with nature gives you a kind of calm state of mind but not about um, that is not the case in india because here it is the poor who are most dependent on the things like rivers or forests etc so environmentalism of the poor is the term that martinez elier coined in order to tell about how environmentalism works in india now environmental issues in india and west a comparison so in continuation of what we have just talked in the previous two slides in the first slide when i told you about environment as a concept to environmental education as a subject then i moved on to the major issues that means the broader issues around say regional divide ideological divide and class divide from there now i move on to comparing india and the west and what i just gave you the background also in terms of environmentalism of the poor or say bourgeois environmentalism let us see here what are the major differences between these two contexts so first is about the presence of green political parties we don't get to see any green political party in india so in a developing country like india or numerous other developing countries we don't have green political parties but countries like germany austria belgium they have something like say they have green political parties in fact overall they have even made european federation of green parties efgp european federation of green party we have eu you must be knowing a european union so as a representative to european union they have this european federation of green parties so all these countries have like their green parties have in a way assembled in order to have their european federation so this is first difference that we don't get to see a green party in a developing country like india then second thing is that the slogans for example clean earth green earth then second is saving the endangered species used in the west but in india it is about the survival of the people dependent on the resources for example forests rivers mountains etc so this is also a point that i just mentioned to you while talking about environmentalism of the poor i told you here that the people who are dependent on say the fisher folk or the forest dwellers so th that is the point that i am mentioning here that in the west nature is about the luxury so for them clean earth green earth is the slogan or even they want to save the endangered species so how do we get to see these issues in india how are the people fighting for resources so recently there has been a niyamgiri struggle in odisha that is that was against mining i will tell you little more about it when i have prepared a separate slide on niyamgiri then uh, there was the save the uh, silent valley movement in kerala there was chipko andolan in uh, uttarakhand etc so there has been there have been numerous movements in india so we get to see that this issue of saving the endangered species which earlier started in west but now it has an impact even in india so i have mentioned this things like say project tiger and project dolphin that gradually we are also now following what the west has been doing that we need to uh, be aware about the conservation of endangered species so that is one you can say that in case of political parties we don't have any green political parties but in terms of these saving the endangered species we are also gradually being aware now the third point that i have mentioned is that that in the west the environmental movements are heavily funded by the multinational companies or you can say corporate sector but in india they are mostly led by the ngos voluntary organizations or environmental groups Uh, these environmental groups can be of two kinds there are some which are mostly based on research there are some which go into advocacy etc and even the people who are affected by the development projects they also get into the environmental movements so this is another point which differentiates the context of india and the west that we don't have such kind of corporate funding for environmental issues in india 
Now I come to environmental movements in India and here I will now tell you about some of the major environmental movements in India. So I have mentioned about four kinds of movements. So some movements which are about saving the forest, so the issue is forest. Some are the anti-dam movements, some are conflicts over marine resources, some are against mining. So the points that I had mentioned to you in the beginning about the range of issues around environment, now you can see their reflection here in this notion of environment movements that for different issues there are different kinds of movements. So if we talk about saving the forest then we had Chipko which is one of the most renowned movement worldwide and we had two uh, leaders who are considered very uh, important. So this movement uh, Chipko took place in Uttarakhand and we have two leaders Sundarlal Bahuguna and Chandi Prasad Bhatt. Then we also had another movement named Apico in Karnataka, the leader of Apico movement was Pandurang Hegde. Then among the anti-dam movements, one of the most renowned is Narmada Bachao Andolan. But at the same time, there was another movement which is called Silent Valley movement which was in Kerala. And there it was the Kerala Sahitya Parishad which played an important role in uh, the Silent Valley movement. In Narmada Bachao Andolan, uh, it was Medha Patkar who is considered as the leader of uh, Narmada Bachao and the short form NBA is more popular and uh, this movement in a way it could, could not get that much of success in India uh, as much we hoped for but at least uh, in terms of raising a kind of awareness among the different developing countries there has been a kind of sensitization that uh, why there should not be such huge uh, dams. That is something which has come, uh, become very prominent in the debate. So anti-dam movements are another very important environmental movements in India. Now coming to the third type which is conflict over marine resources. In the coastal areas we get to see the marine resources. So there for the conservation of that for instance in Odisha, Andhra Pradesh and Goa all those states where there is marine, uh, marine resources are there. So conservation of those resources is important. One prominent example is the Chilka Bachao Andodan. Chilka is a lake in Odisha and in order to conserve Chilika Lake, this Chilika Bachao Andolan took place in Odisha. Against mining again, of course the mining takes place in such states where uh, there are mountains and uh, be beneath the mountain there, there are mining. Uh, e even uh, in the plain area sometimes some lands are considered as you know, that there can be uh, things like say bauxite etc uh, beneath the land. So uh, those states often feel that uh, they feel in a way that the mining companies will come and they will uh, take away their uh, land. First of all the land is taken on lease and then the process of mining starts. So there uh, you find that in Koraput district in Odisha people have fought against companies like Nalco and Balco that's one. Then in Niamgiri struggle which was in the Kalahandi and Raigarh district, there the Dongaria Kond tribe they fought against this Vedanta company. Then uh, you also have Koila Satyagraha in Raigarh district of Chhattisgarh. So these are some of well known movements which were uh, against the mining. Now let me come to major environmental concerns. So what are the major concerns? One is the first of all it is the conservation of land. And when we say land then we are concerned about its protection from soil erosion as well as say things like land erosion etc. Second is forest conservation. So conserving the forest is important as even in Chipko we talked about conservation of forest. Third is protection of biodiversity. So biodiversity can be there in the say areas where mountains are there or even when there are forests there there is uh, biodiversity in the coastal areas there is biodiversity. So the moment we mention biodiversity then it is about the say flora and fauna and India happens to be uh, very rich in terms of its biodiversity. So any kind of environmental degradation 
leads to a loss of biodiversity. So protection of biodiversity is one of the major concerns. Now we come to the protection of tropical forests. So there, there is tropical area in India also. So you get to see participation of local people. So involving the local people, those who know about their area, what kind of flor flora fauna is there, because the local people have better idea or you can say they have a sense what is there in their habitat. So involving them for the forest management can be useful. Then conservation of wildlife and endangered species as I mentioned earlier also things like say project tiger, project dolphin, there is also a, say save the black bucks etc. So numerous kinds of wild animals are often it is uh, debated that we need to conserve them in order to have our environment in a good condition. Then we have green revolution and green revolution in a way it made our economy self-sufficient in terms of agricultural products but it had huge impact on environment. For example, uh, I would here like to talk about two major impacts of green revolution. Let me first mention it to you. One is the depleting groundwater. So there since excessive water was used, so the level of groundwater has gone down that is one. And second, you get to see that the soil got polluted. So soil pollution is another issue. So first is due to excessive use of water and second is due to excessive use of pesticides. So due to use of insecticides and pesticides, the soil got polluted. So soil pollution. So the same thing which can be good for in one way can be bad in another way. So green revolution was good because it, it brought us prosperity, it gave us agricultural you can say prospect. But at the same time when it comes to environment then that way it was not good. Next point is the waste disposal and management. So this is another one of the you can say most difficult area because the amount of waste that we are producing and the technology that we have for the waste management, they just do not match. For example, if we are producing 100 kilograms of waste, then the actual disposal capacity that we have is not even 20 kilograms. So this kind of a mismatch between what we are producing and what we are able to go for a clean kind of disposal. So that is leading to maybe some of you would have seen the huge piles of uh, garbage here and there. In fact, in a city like say Delhi, if you go to the NCR, then in the Gajipur area, you will get to see that there is a huge mountain of just the garbage. Even in Mumbai, if you will just move to the suburb, if you move from the main city to go to the little uh, say backward kind of area, you will get to see that the, the garbage is dumped here and there. And sometimes garbage is dumped on the river bed. So the area which should actually be clean is actually used for dumping the garbage. So that is the point that I wanted to uh, mention that waste disposal and management is and in fact uh, now how to uh, minimize the use of plastic or for instance you will get to see that the plastic bottles that we use the cold ring or other things. So plastic bottle is one of then similarly the polythene that we use. So minimizing the use of plastic is one of the uh, uh, could be a contribution that we can have. Then next is watershed management. So watershed management the different areas wherever there is there are rivers how do we conserve the watershed areas is also something one of the uh, major environmental concern. Then the second last point that I have mentioned is to stop the construction of big dams. So here I am not saying that there should be no dams but we need to move away from big dams. So whatever the size that we require maybe a medium sized dam if, if that will do then let, let's not make size of dam as a prestige issue that oh the bigger the dam more prosperous the country. So we can have lesser constructions of big dams. Then to clean the rivers because nowadays numerous small rivers are dying, uh, many of the rivers are extremely polluted and that has led to uh, health hazards in uh, different states of India. So cleaning the rivers you must have heard of NMCG, 
namami gange project to clean ganga so cleaning ganga should also extend to the other small rivers which are the tributaries of these big rivers so uh, cleaning rivers is something which should not just be an action which the state needs to take uh, but also the civil society needs to come together in order to clean the rivers so here you can now see that we have listed a huge range of things in order to tell about the environmental concerns so from be it biodiversity or the wildlife waste disposal so you may actually just see the things around yourself and all those things about which you feel bad or or how there is this environmental degradation taking place they actually become in a way they can become environmental concern for us now i have just mentioned four to five movements in order to tell you little bit more about those movements for example first is chipko movement so chipko movement is one of the most renowned environmental movement and took place in india but it is known worldwide and i have even put this picture so let me first make you see this picture for some time that it is the women who are holding this tree and so it is also called hugging the trees that they were the women they in order to stop the people who had come to cut the trees they said that we will not allow you to cut the trees so this picture tells a lot about say the women who are dependent on those forests or say trees they don't want that, them to be cut so in a way if we look at nature as part of our life our everyday life and those who come to cut the trees those who need the timber so uh, the companies coming to take the the trees in order to make some products for example the furnitures are to be made or for instance in case of chipko it was a company which had to produce bats the the cricket playing bats so uh, for the manufacturing of such things also we need wood sometimes we need uh, timber in order to make furnitures or for construction of houses so though we do understand that we need trees but at the same time where the people will protest there you cannot uh, cut the trees so let us see what happened in case of chipko so it was in the 1970s so 1970s is a very important juncture because that is the time when even at the global arena the issue of environment was emerging that we need to think about environment and terms like sustainable development and other things were gradually becoming part of our wider discourse so in 1970s it was the popular narrative of people especially women who hugged the trees in order to save them from deforestation so people were against this idea of deforestation so there was this conflict between the local people who were dependent on the forest products for their daily needs and the state so state was promoting the private sports company to use the timber so what we often get to see is that it is the the companies have the support by the state but when they go to the ground there the people are resisting so then it eventually becomes a fight between people and the state because uh, state stands for the company because state feels that whatever the revenue that the company will give it to the state that will be beneficial for them so the core question in case of chipko is who is the legitimate owner of the forest because the people say that they have been living there for a very long time it is not that they have any kind of paper to show that they they are not the owners but at the same time does the state become the owner so here the issue is between commons and commodity let me tell you quickly about commons what is commons commons is something on which nobody has an ownership and commodity is something that you can buy and sell so how do we look at forest is forest something which we can buy can somebody buy a forest or can the state claim that state is the sole owner and that's why state can just sell the forest to a company so this is something the question was raised by people like sundar lal bahuguna to gora devi and chandi prasad bhat so gora devi is 
the one of the main leaders she was a, a woman leader and uh, other than that sundarlal bahuguna and chandi prasad bhat they were the people who used so what were the techniques that were used in these protests one was hugging the trees that i have just shown you the picture also other than that they held padyatras padyatras are uh, the walking on foot so they were uh, raising awareness among the people while walking then they organized dharnas they even had the rasta roko abhiyan they did not allow the company to enter to come there to fell the trees there is a scholar named haripriya rangan uh, who has even studied this chipko andolan and she has linked it to uh, the formation of this new state she says that it is the chipko andolan which eventually uh, became the reason behind uh, the creation of this new state called uttarakhand so gradually it was uh, about this notion that people should have control on their resources it's something that they ended up demanding for a new state so haripriya rangan she links chipko andolan with the creation of uttarakhand as a state uh another thing another scholar named shekhar pathak who has recently uh, written a book 40 verse mein chipko that in that he has studied about the chipko andolan and where has it reached in 40 years he has underlined two lines within chipko and he says while sundarlal bahuguna had more of a gandhian approach that means about using the nature to the least or why we need to keep the nature as it is keeping it intact on the other hand chandi prasad bhat had more of a socialist orientation and i have told you about gandhian and socialist so if these are two different ways of looking at the same issue then bhat was more interested in the class issue because within the movement also there is a divide not all the people think about the resources in the same way so the class divide who should have the control upon the forests and chandi prasad bhat made this organization name dhasoli gram swaraj sangathan dgss so if you will google about this organization you will get to know more about dgss how does it function and in gram swaraj you can see that this is closer to the idea of gandhi so chandi prasad bhat was initially not just initially but most of his life he kept working with sundarlal bahuguna but at the same time he had a bit of socialist orientation so he was interested in knowing this issue that how can we actually make the people more uh, self reliable so the the success of the movement uh, lies in that they could stop the construct uh, they could stop the company from felling the trees so in that sense uh, the success of chipko became you can say other movements also as i mentioned to you that apiko andolan took place in karnataka or even say silent valley movement so gradually there was this kind of awareness was raised among people and they started getting aware of the environmental issues now i move on to the second movement which is narmada bachao andolan if chipko was in 1970s then narmada bachao andolan is in 1980s and again it is one of the most renowned move, so environmental movements worldwide so why do we talk about it is mainly because this movement brought one issue which is alternative development let me tell you what is alternative development so a given path of capitalist model of development when you question that and you say that there there is a possibility of a different kind of development for example if we think of being based on needs so not to show a large dam in order to that oh if india has a huge dam then india is a very powerful country no you can have five seven smaller dams for five seven different places so you should not think of these things in terms of ego that in order to have a big dam it's something which shows a powerful country so alternative development will actually stress upon a decentralized economy means smaller scales of uh, industries so small scale industries or or people should be dependent on themselves so self sufficient economy is something that they look forward to so how did this movement start this movement started in 1980s first of all as a 
all the big movements initially they start as a local movement and gradually they take take up a bigger form and it was against the construction of Sardar Sarovar Dam SSD in Madhya Pradesh. But at the same time two other states were also affected by it which were Gujarat and Maharashtra. So you should know that three states were affected by NBA which are Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat and Maharashtra. Now what were the issues involved? Why are we talking about Narmada Bachao or why did the people protest against this construction? So one was there was this large scale of displacement, a huge amount of people were to be displaced from one place to another, which would have also led to loss of commons. So not just the people, but also the flora, fauna of that place, ecology, biodiversity, everything was to be disturbed due to. So when we talk about the construction of dams, it actually involves lot many things. So how did it start? It started under the leadership of Medha Patkar and then eventually NBA also led to the formation of another organization called NAPM. The full form of NAPM is National Alliance of People's Movements. So why NAPM? So what NAPM does is that it has a you can say coalition of more than 500 small movements going on across the country. So for instance some movements are being done by the fishing community, some being done by the forest dwellers all those numerous movements, the small scale movements, they have united under the banner of NAPM. So that is the National Alliance of People's Movements. So numerous small movements be it in Kerala or Bihar, UP, it has a, you can say all India convenership. So while NBA was only about the Narmada Bachao Andolan, so from NBA to NAPM. Those who are interested, they can uh, learn little bit more about NAPM and you can even understand that this idea of alternative development is something which is linked to NAPM because what do people look for? They want to have such model of development which makes them more self-sufficient. So that is there. So similar to Chipko, even here we will talk about techniques of protest. So there were dharnas, there were padyatras. Padyatras are walking on foot or say foot marches. Then there were even court cases because here you see that there is this interesting turn that the civil society activists, they even decide to go for fighting a case in the court. So against the state also these, uh, those who are protesting, they go on to file a case and then they involve the judiciary for fighting such cases in order to see who has the legitimate claim, whether people should have their claim upon the reverse or whether it should be state. So uh, who will take such decisions? So judiciary happens to mediate between the two, the state and the people. Now if we talk about success, then uh, if we say Chipko was much more successful because in case of Chipko, they could stop the company. But that is not the case with Narmada. In Narmada, the construction did take place. So uh, in that sense, its actual success is bleak. But if we look at this formation of NAPM, then that is a huge success. If we look at uh, the global solidarity that Narmada Bachao was about this anti-dam, then numerous other developing countries also became aware. And here I would like to tell you that in the first world countries, in the developed countries, they have stopped making big dams and now the big dams are made in the developing countries. So now what has happened is that there, there is a kind of global solidarity among the developing countries and they are trying to protest against the large dams. So in that sense I would like to say that the success is two way. If uh, it could form NAPM that could be seen as its success or if it could have the global solidarity but its failure is that it could not stop the, uh, the making of the dam. So that is Narmada Bachao. This is one picture that I had put. Uh, maybe I could have shown it to you a little later. But you can see that the presence of women in huge number. Maybe because of the fact that Medha Patkar is the leader of Narmada Bachao Andolan. And also when it is about rivers, then women are more affected when such things take place. So this is the banner of Narmada Bachao. As I told you about dharanas, 
so this is one of the dharna picture that they sit on um, say fasting they say that we will be fasting for two three days or something like that now i come to the silent valley movement which took place in kerala so i have taken up these examples of different kinds of movement even in this case silent valley movement it is it was against the construction of a hydroelectric project so you have seen one case of saving the forest then the second case i told you about anti dam movement and here it was about to stop the construction of a hydroelectric project so there was this uh, river called kunthi puza river in kerala uh, where it was about the case of nature conservation so if a hydroelectric power point will be a uh, pro project will be made then it will have adverse impact on the nature means the biodiversity so it was that construction had to take place by the kerala state electricity board kseb so in most of the cases you will see that it is the these movements are state versus people because the, if the state takes up the projects of development and if it affects adversely to the people then they go for protests and the protests eventually take up the form of movements so in this case it was against this electricity board when it was supposed to construct a hydroelectric dam then it, the protest started in 1979 then one samiti was made which was called prakriti sanrakshan samiti if we translate it in english then prakriti is nature sanrakshan is conservation and samiti is committee maybe i should have written it in english also but i would like to tell you that it is nature conservation committee and this in hindi maybe that because in malayalam they must have named it prakriti sanrakshan samiti so this was to investigate what kind of impacts it is going to have if this construction takes place uh, but eventually due to people's immense pressure that time indira gandhi was the prime minister and she declared that uh, silent valley will be conserved silent valley is actually a very uh, beautiful place in terms of biodiversity overall only the entire kerala is very beautiful but if you will look at these valley areas then the uh, the uh, biodiversity rich areas these are so indira gandhi was in favor of uh, uh, conservation of biodiversity and she ordered that such a project will be called off so eventually what happened is that later on rajiv gandhi rather made a national park so silent valley national park was constructed so the silent valley is considered as a successful environmental movement because the the people's protests led to closure of uh, this kind of a uh, construction so this is silent valley then the fourth i have mentioned is the anti coca cola struggle so anti coca cola struggle took place in plachi mada village of kerala where coca cola started construction of a plant and there what happened is that due to the construction of this plant there was this depletion of ground water then also the sludge that they were producing the chemicals that they were producing after uh, the production of coca cola that is also that that spoiled the quality of soil in that area so the local people they started uh, they started protesting against coca cola plant so eventually what happened is that that plant was also closed and uh, although that plant was closed in 2004 but even till the time i last visited that area i saw that uh, the water is still not fit for drinking so uh, later on this committee high power committee was formed in order to look at this thing that how much uh, loss that company has done to the people and that amount was 216 crore that the amount of loss that the people have faced because the soil that got uh, polluted or even the ground water which is not fit for drinking for a very long time so that case has been going on now in supreme court where people are fighting for their rights and now coca cola has said that it will it will not reopen that plant and it has completely hand over the so what happens is that in most of the cases whenever such a uh, kind of constructions take place they initially say that it will give employment to people but uh, the environmental degradation is 
much more you can say problematic vis-a-vis -vis the kind of uh, gains that the people have. So this is the fourth um, case that I told you. Fifth is, okay, I have written a little bit more. Let me just quickly tell you about what are the issues which are there. So one was that this committee which were formed, then there is something called the blame game which starts that what is the role of the government. So it is important to learn here that though it was the left government, but at the same time, they did not pay much attention to the problems faced by the people. So people, for instance, there is one person named Vilyodi Venugopal. He also joined that NAPM, which I mentioned to you in case of Narmada Bachao. So Plachi Mada struggle also joined that National Alliance for People's Movement. So now there are three, four issues which are uh, involved. One is the corporate social responsibility, CSR. So how do we fight against the corporate when it, it takes away our land or if it, there is no groundwater? Second is the issue of human rights violations. So people often feel that numerous kinds of human rights are also under pressure. Then there was this loss of agricultural land. So these are the three, four major issues due to which we should learn about anti-Coca-Cola struggle. Then fifth I have mentioned is Niyamgiri Andolan and I have put a picture also, this picture. Here the women whom you see, they are of Dongaria Kond tribe. This image is from Odisha. Niyamgiri struggle took place in Odisha and it is considered as one of the most successful environmental movements in recent past. Let me quickly tell you what happened. So this movement is considered as a new social movement. Why new social movement? Because different issues or different groups have come together, be it the tribals, their cultural rights issue, environmental issue, human rights violation issue. So in that sense, Niyamgiri Andolan can be studied when we talk about human rights movements there also or the protection of tribals cultural rights there also. So here I am looking at this from an environmental point, point of view. So we get to see that Niyamgiri hills, uh, Niyamgiri hills are something, uh, those mountains are looked as a god by this Dongaria Kond tribe. They say that this mountain is our god, but uh, for, the, for the state, state government of Odisha, it gave, uh, it signed an MOU, Memorandum of, of Understanding with Vedanta company. When the state goes for such kind of action, then it looks at what kind of economic gains that we are going to have. But the Dongaria Kond tribe, though Vedanta is an immensely powerful company, we just saw the case of Coca-Cola. So maybe the success of Plachimada struggle is something which in a way inspired Niyamgiri struggle also. So people decided to fight. So Dongaria Kon tribe decided to fight and they started questioning that for them it is the god but for the state it is just the mountain and it is just the minerals that they look for. So for them it is the money. So it became what is important our belief that mountain is something that we want to save or it is the money which the state will get. So uh, the success of Niyamgiri struggle because Supreme Court ordered in favor of uh, the Dongaria Kon and they, it was said that their belief that they want to save the mountain is much more. So in that sense, I wanted to tell you that we must understand the movements from these different aspects. There is this uh, aspect of corporate being involved, then there is state which is involved, there is issue of human rights, there is issue of environmental degradation. So you get to see that there are different aspects which get entangled with each other and we cannot understand one thing being separate from another. So the same mountain which is a god for the tribal community, it is something which is seen as that the minerals are to be taken away from that. So the success of Niyamgiri struggle has given a lot of hope to uh, the numerous environmental movements which are taking place uh, worldwide. So nowadays, saving the rivers, saving the mountains, these are the things which are very much being talked about. Now I come to the conclusion which is the last slide of my lecture and then I will just mention some of the references. So the point I want to make is that 
in 50 years we have come a long way from Chipko in 1970s to Niamgiri struggle and you can see that there is this wide span of issues which are there from deforestation, air pollution to dying rivers and mining etc. So all those things that we see which are happening around us and all those major environmental concerns are something that we need to be aware about. So what is the issue that is coming up again and again is that whether state is a custodian or an owner. If somebody will be a custodian means that being will just conserve or will take care of that thing. But being an owner you can misuse that thing or you can give that thing to somebody else to spoil it. So it is being questioned by the people whether a state can be considered an owner or not. Post globalization means after 1990s this issue of presence of multinational companies has led to further this thing that so along with state now multinational companies are another you can say claimant be it coca cola or vedanta they are also claiming and along with state now they are the new actors which are there so how to stop human rights violation or how to ensure corporate social responsibility these are the major issues then la next point i have mentioned is about climate change and global warming so the, these are the two issues around which environmental issues need urgent attention and recently uh, some of you must have heard of greta thunberg who is uh, a very uh, you can say not even 20 years old but she has emerged as one of the say young leaders on environmental issue and she has been stressing on minimalism. So I would like to say that we need to have a global solidarity in which not just the states or for example the intergovernmental kind of a thing but also the civil society need to come together. So we need to ensure that more and more number of people uh, organizations be it educational institutions or say administrative organ all of us need to come together because conserving the environment is not something that one person or one country can do because this is ultimately a global concern so that is the last point that I wanted to make that in order to save the environment along with these movements we all need to have a solidarity kind of thing in the last slide I have mentioned some of the references I have mentioned about Amita Bhaviskar's article, she has written this uh, a recent book called Uncivil City, uh, Ecology, Equity and the Commons in Delhi and here you get to know about the different issues, equity etc. Then uh, this two cultures revisited environment development debate, the link between these two. Uh, similarly Martinez Alliers, I had mentioned about environmentalism of the poor, so you can read that article by Elliot. You can also read this book by Haripriya Rangan about whom I told you that how Chipko Andolan uh, eventually became the reason for the formation of a new state. So that book also you can read. Other than that Ramchandra Guha has written a lot about environmental issues and you can even read this book Environmentalism, a global history in which you will get to know about the divide between global south and global north. So I hope that you enjoyed the lecture and uh, hopefully you will read some of these uh, readings that I have mentioned and in case you have any difficulty then you can even write an email to me and I am writing my email id jnuruchi at the rate of gmail.com. In case of any query after this lecture you would like to ask something you may ask me. So with that I end this lecture. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. 
And here I'm not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I'm also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.